over my head. I hear music in the air over my head. The concept of people being lesser than, uh, people having um, less mental ability or creative ability, it's all a fallacy. And I am always so proud to see the accomplishments of my people regardless to what they have been through. Um, and so I, there's so much, especially in New Orleans, has happened when it comes to music that we, um, we don't talk about often enough. And the fact of, I, when I think of my great-great-grandmother, the fact that she went to church where they spoke French, that she spoke Creole at home, that she uh, had a, a person who she worked for who spoke English, and she was blind, and she had 13 children, and she negotiated all of that. That we are an amazing people to, to manage difficulty and to get through difficulty. Well, New Orleans quickly became an opera mecca uh, in all of North America. If you did not perform in New Orleans, you were not a star, you were not a, uh, a noteworthy talent. And we produced our first opera here in 1796. And uh, from that time on, we had five opera houses and free people of color performed in the pits. Um, and they uh, were composers as well. Um, one of the stories that I like to tell, at a point in, uh, during Spanish rule, uh, because it was started by France and they continued it, the King of France said that on Sundays, this is a Catholic place you cannot make the enslaved work on a Sunday. So that meant they had to fend for themselves on a Sunday. And that's why we see the Congo Square experience where they go and they've had a little plot of garden, they go and, and sell their wares and then there's music happening there in Congo Square. But those who had particular skills would hire themselves out if they were plasterers or iron workers or that sort of thing. And the money that they made, they saved to buy their freedom but they also bought tickets to the opera. So we have historians that have come through and seen enslaved people walk in the streets of New Orleans singing operatic arias and said, what is this? <laughs> and so it was um, like the pop music of the time. It was well loved. Um, and it was um, one of the things that I think really helped to save New Orleans because it wasn't in terms of weather and pestilence, it was not really a great place to live. And so um, having this culture brought into the city and that people can enjoy was one of the things that saved New Orleans in its early years. Um, but those who were trained here in New Orleans by um, other free people of color who went to France to get trained and came back and taught music, they were able to publish which in one way you think that's really great. The, these were white publishers that did not impede their ability to publish music. Edmond Dede published his first piece in 1852, but especially because of his skin color as being a dark skinned man, um, he, he really had a lot of resistance in really being able to fully do what he wanted to do. But he did write art songs. And once he got to France, he was writing symphonies and choral works and, and operas, um, and was able to really expand on his goals there. It was fragile in that um, they were able to attend the opera, they were in the pits of the opera, they even had their own independent orchestra in 1840 of 100 free men of color and some whites. Um, but the more we got towards the 1850s, 1860s, things just really started getting clamped down because there was just too many of us. And um, the rules started clamping down, so they started kicking people out of the opera house. They didn't want them going. They didn't want them participating in certain things. And so it was kind of a fragile existence, but, um, but the greatness of the music was not diminished. And we definitely have to give them credit for that. Lucien Lambert went on from New Orleans. He had to leave too. 
went on to Paris and to South America, Edmond Dede. And Basile Barre is really a great story because he was born enslaved, um, owned by a man who had a piano store. And somehow, either through this man's intervention um, and working with other free composers of color, he learned to play the piano and excelled and was publishing his piano pieces when he was still enslaved. Um, he did get to perform in Paris. Uh, and when the owner died, um, he stayed at the piano store and helped to run the piano store. And there's a piano in the Roosevelt Hotel that was restored as one of the last pianos he sold. It's in the lobby and there's a sign talking about Basile Barre uh, in the lobby of the Roosevelt Hotel, which is amazing to me. So his music is just absolutely gorgeous. When you think about the fact that New Orleans made uh, the American premiere of almost 200 operas that came from Europe, uh, and those, those operas are still in what we call the canon, that everybody knows the names of them, operas all over the United States, all over the world still perform them, had they been able to fully express themselves and fully um, uh, work their craft, they could be part of the canon. And it's one of the things that I'm uh, very passionate about when I talk to people, uh, not only in Opera Creole's work, but in talking to other opera companies, you need to give them a voice and you need to uh, introduce them into the canon because they are just as worthy as Verdi and Mozart and all of those people. Um, so the limitations placed on them did not allow for their productions to be um, uh, uh, given their full due here in New Orleans. In fact, one of uh, Edmond Dede's operas he wrote around 1868 in Paris, uh, other than the overture, has never been performed. And we have it in his original handwriting, 550 pages, fully orchestrated in French, and it's just beautiful music. So that's one of our passions to get it done. But and as we talk about racial equity now and inclusion and diversity, my mission is to say, listen to these composers, introduce them into the canon, present them as part of your season as if they belong, not an off thing that we're gonna just kind of throw on the side and we hope the black people come, but we're gonna really present them in their full glory. And um, that's something I'm hoping for. But in the meantime, we continue to do our, our job in presenting them. Primarily their music was of the French opera genre, the French you know, romanticism and that sort of thing, exoticism. Um, and maybe they thought that if they did touch on those things, it would impede them even more so. Um, one of the pieces that Edmond Dede did do after leaving New Orleans, while he was in Paris, he went down to Algeria in Africa at a time when I think the British were taking over and, and the Arabs there were fighting against their occupation. And he wrote a wonderful aria about that, about the father telling the son you know, the, to fight, that there's, the Quran says there's no better, um, uh, better thing to do than to chase the lion back across the desert. So he did speak then, um, but in terms of music that was written locally, they did their best in writing things that were dance pieces, things for balls, uh, pieces that we, people would purchase, you know, for those kinds of things. But I wish that they'd had, you know, more of an ability to really talk about the times. And, um, and fortunately, as far as I know at this point, they, they have it. So if we fast forward to about the 1930s, we see the emergence of Marian Anderson. Um, and she was determined to be a, a talent as a kid. And she happened to go to an opera and she thought, oh, I could never do that. That's just the most wonderful thing. But she wanted to study. And the people in her church raised the money for her to go to the school. She went to the school to audition and she sat there and waited and waited and one person after the next auditioned and auditioned. And finally the girl says, what do you want? And she says, well, I'm here to audition, but we don't take colored people and sent her out. And she was disheartened by it, but somehow found her way 
to um, regain her strength and her resolve to do what she needed to do. And she toured all over Europe, but um, when there was an arrangement to do a concert um, for the Daughters of the American Revolution, they wouldn't allow her you know, to come home and do a concert there. And uh, President of the United States and First Lady got involved and arranged the concert on the, uh, the, at the Lincoln Memorial, which was revolutionary. Um, think of 30, 40,000 people just showed up. And it's one of those moments in opera that even though this um, terrible thing happened to her, it was her presence and her artistry was one of those that said, see, it's all a fallacy. You know, that I am a great artist. I have a great voice. I have poise. I have language. Uh, I can do everything that you can do. And it made a statement for us in terms of civil rights without her making any kind of, you know, saying anything about civil rights. It was just her standing there in her greatness. Um, that was inspiration to me when I, when I learned about her. Um, the other part of that, before she comes on the scene, one of my heroes uh, was born a slave. Her name was Elizabeth Taylor Greenfield. Uh, the woman that owned her and her parents decided she didn't want any more to do with slavery. So she moved and joined the Quakers in Philadelphia. Um, the parents wanted to go back to Africa, so she funded their trip back to Africa, to Liberia. But because Elizabeth showed this musical prowess, she wanted to support her. She had trouble getting anybody to even teach her to sing because they just, you know, assumed she didn't have the intellect or they didn't want a black singer in their studio. But finally, she did find someone. Um, and by, I think it was 1852 or 55, she made her debut in New York at Metropolitan Hall in New York. Um, interesting thing was she would receive these great reviews. So curious people would come to see this dark skinned woman all dressed up singing operatic stuff. And she would get these great reviews, but then they would say, as long as I didn't look at her, I could enjoy her voice. And they called her the black swan because the voice was so beautiful. She later um, uh, performed for Queen Victoria. And um, so she's the first that we have documented uh, as an opera singer uh, and made her way back to New Orleans, but I mean, not New Orleans, but to America, but died in obscurity. So she didn't come back home to the success she should have had but we have been stepping out in this greatness no matter what, no matter what. One of the things that has always impacted me as I look at the American spiritual is that here's a people that were piled onto ships in humane conditions, muddled together of different tribes so that they couldn't speak to each other. They had all different languages. Come to a place they've never been before, forced into servitude under worse conditions, working from, as they say, can see to can't see. And beautiful music came out of them. The spirit of our people is amazing, amazing. That is the thing, that the music that comes through, even in all of that pain, even in all of that disenfranchisement, even in not knowing and being beaten out of their language and their culture, and, and, but they managed to keep some of that as much as they could. You know, they worked hard to keep some of it surviving. But the beauty of the music that came out in the middle of the cotton fields and the corn fields, and the, it is amazing. You know, and it warms my heart. And um, there's, there's this one simple song that I just love. It's um, over my head. I hear music in the air. Over my head. I hear music in the air over my head 
I hear music in the air. There must be a God somewhere. I mean, I can see them in the middle of the fields. I don't know what she's hearing. I don't know if she's hearing the birds. I don't know what she's hearing over her head. But to equate that sound with evidence of God, when nothing in their lives gave them any indication that there was any power invested in them. I mean, that truly gets me every time I think about it. We are just an amazing people. And I, I am sorry that we still are here fighting. I'm sorry that we're still fighting, that we're still trying to tell people we matter. Um, but that song always just, it, to me, is the epitome of who we are in our spirit, that we understand things beyond what's right in front of us, and that we still find sacredness and love and happiness regardless. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Oh my goodness, I'm sorry. No, you need some tissue. Let me get you some tissue. <laughs> oh God. I just I just don't understand why we have to work so hard to just say, people, get over yourselves. You know? <laughs> I don't understand. I mean, when I was your age, I really never imagined that we would still be doing this. When I was your age, um, you know, I was in, I was doing theater. I had white friends. We were going to each other's houses. Um, so many things were happening. I thought, wow, this is just going to go up from here. Thank you so much. I just said, this is just going to go up from here. And some of those friends, I still have them as friends, but I never imagined that we would still be fighting these same things over and over and over again. Um, I can remember how proud my dad was to take me to vote when I could first vote. And he, here we are still fighting about voting. It's insanity. We, America has an insanity problem. <laughs> I'm just to put that on the camera. Yeah. 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 It's a certain kind of insanity. But, um, there's this, this comedian, um, I can't think of his name. He was on the, uh, the Daily Show with Trevor Noah. Which one? Um, oh, something Junior. I can't think of what his full name is. But he was saying, somebody said to him, you know, I didn't know that black people were so upset. Yeah. He said, we've been upset. We created the blues, a whole genre about being upset. How did y'all miss it? <laughs> <laughs> no, anyway. He said we were in New Orleans uh, in in Africa going, ah, you know, having this, and then we came here. Bloom, 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 bloom. <laughs> so now one thing I will add. After Reconstruction, they really started kicking people out of opera altogether. And um, that was a bad thing. But to show you um, the economic power that we had in terms of opera, when they kicked out um, Victor Eugene McCarthy, black folks said, we're not buying any more tickets for this season at the French Opera House. We're not buying any more tickets. They decided to protest. The end of the season, the French Opera House did not have the money to send the singers back to France. That's how we economically impacted that. But being who we are, they had a benefit for those singers. Free people of color got together and gave a concert and raised the money for them so that they could get back to France. It didn't hurt the singers. Is that a story? That's who we are. 
So we got kicked out and then all of a sudden, you know, there was not a slave or free or whatever. Everybody was black people over here, got kicked over there. The blessing of that is the ones who were classically trained came together with the ones who were not trained and created jazz. That's how it happened. So even though they were in Storyville, um, uh, you know, in these brothels, people who were coming to the brothels were also people who had money to go to the opera. So they were still there playing operatic overtures on the piano. They're still playing the music, but by coming together, there was this new creation of an art form. And so it was a blessing uh, to New Orleans in that way. But it, it all started with this opera culture that people don't talk about. Yeah. Well, what I was gonna say in connection with that, one of the things that I really enjoy in my work with Opera Creole is seeing the faces of people that are learning who they are. I never thought we did that. I never knew we did that. White and black, that this uh, history of New Orleans. And I think once we, if we can get past the fear, and I don't think we really want white people to live in guilt. We just want to say, okay, this is really what happened. What do we do about it? Um, and when we see this music and, and the stories of these great free composers of color, I see it change people. And the more we can tell our stories, the more I think we have the chance to change. And that's what I really love so much about our work. Somebody's, uh, said to me when I was 35, you know, you should give up on all that singing stuff. You know, you should, you're old and whatever, you know, and I, and it made me think of all of the years that people kept trying to tell me who I was supposed to be, or what I was supposed to like, what kind of music I was supposed to do. You're black, we don't do that. And a lot of the issues around slavery is all in these boxes. Everything is in the box, so, you know, this is, this is what happened, but this is not what happened. And they're just making this up, or they're still using it as an excuse, or it's all of these boxes. But there's truth that has to come through for her to, us to finally be free of all the boxes. Last night I was saying to somebody, and you know, this doesn't have to be on. All I learned about George Washington in school was that he chopped down a cherry tree, right? And that he was this great leader and first president of the United States. Turns out he didn't chop down the cherry tree, right? So that was a story we were told, for what reason, I don't know. But it was only a few weeks ago in watching a documentary that I found out that when he was president and the president's house was in Philadelphia and he took his slaves to Philadelphia, the law there was if you stayed six months, you were free. He would switch them out at five and a half months. So we have this, we're writing this beautiful declaration and this whole idea of equity, and not only does he own slaves, but he's skirting the law as president of the United States. That's something we should talk about. The only one that didn't own slaves was John Adams, and he's the only one that doesn't have any monuments. See any monuments to John Adams? No. 